and gentlemen, what's going on? We're sitting here with Patrick Stolly. How you doing, sir? Good. I'm doing good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming on over here, making the journey. Not a problem. Yeah, yeah. Now. I cross the river. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stay in Iowa? I mean, I live in Iowa, but I'm in Illinois quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I sort of claim Illinois as my home state anymore. Were you, uh, you, are you are you originally from the QC? Yeah, Davenport. Cool, cool. Man, it's a little crazy with the bridge shit going on all the yeah traffic. i felt a little bit lucky to be able to get across it yeah yeah without too much trouble Just fingers crossed every time it's like there's always something popping i think it's up. easier getting over here yeah yeah somehow. definitely for now anyway but i wonder if it's gonna get better or worse it's just gonna be a mess for a while it'll be good when the bridge is done <laughs> yeah one of these years right but uh yeah so you you're the sole founder of uh future apple tree studio Kind of. I mean, it. Um, Future Apple Tree was really uh, a collective label of a bunch of bands that in the early 2000s, uh, we'd been on labels and done stuff and um, wanted to, we had more music to put out and we just said, let's just do it ourselves. Mm-hmm. So we started just releasing it through the, the label and, you know, came up with the catalog numbers and um, did all that, you know, hired PR people and we would manage releases and we actually had a post office box at that point in time. You know, I was like just on the edge of the internet kind of doing more stuff. I mean, no one was really streaming anything or whatever. People were buying physical CDs and mm-hmm. it was mostly CDs. But the label kind of, I did a lot of the recording for a lot of the bands that were on the label. So it was sort of my idea to call the studio Future Apple Tree because of that. Um, and the label still exists. The website's still floating on the internet, I guess, but we don't really do that much with it. Okay. We'll release stuff and put the imprint on there, mm-hmm. but we don't get too freaky about catalog numbers and things like that. It's more kind of people who have been involved will do a release through it, like the new Trip Master Monkey record that's coming out. That's released through it because uh, Jamie, who's a guitar player in Trip Master Monkey, was in a band called Ten Key. That was originally a uh, future apple tree band and then crash chris, chris the singer has a band called crash that's still current that uh has released stuff through there so okay they did that and then, then like when the last multiple cat things that i put out we ended up just using the imprint just the label like the logo and right sell it through and put it on the on the website hell yeah and then that just goes to a link to somewhere else to buy it or you know band camp or whatever mm-hmm so now what year was that started? I think it was maybe 2003. Okay. Nice. So that's Around quite a while now. 2002, 2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah, time just kind of keeps going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how was it really difficult in the beginning getting everything started and put together? Not really. Uh, it just took money. Yeah. You know, people, you know, putting stuff on credit cards and pressing up CDs. And, you know, we we're de- at that time dealing with lots of mailing envelopes and people would order through us and we had a little bit of distribution through a couple of people, but, um, more or less just kind of footwork and, and, you know, had a little rubber stamp made with the address, the PO box and would stamp the envelopes and right, right. seal them shut and go to the post office box with bunches of CDs. And Hell obviously yeah. now anyone just kind of downloads stuff and right. So are you mainly, you said you're still releasing CDs now, like when you, um, yeah, we were releasing music. Mm-hmm. Um, some, I guess it, usually things come out on CD. People still like to buy them. Right, right. You know, for whatever reason. I mean, they sound good. I, I'm a, kind of a oh, vinyl, yeah. vinyl person myself. I like records. They're expensive to make. Yeah. And obviously a few extra steps to, to get them made. Yeah. Have you guys ever released any vinyl? Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Yeah, the new Trip Master will be on vinyl and... I think Crash did vinyl a couple records ago, and last couple multiple cat records are on vinyl. Nice, nice. Now you said, uh, what was the reason you chose that name? Future Apple Tree. Yeah, you guys planting seeds out there. Um, growing trees. Yeah, I guess kind of. It was sort of like just another reference to a seed. Mm-hmm. And then the logo is an apple with a tree, sort of inside it. Nice. Uh, this this woman Sarah, I can't remember her last name now. She was a, one of the people who was involved's girlfriend at the time. She mm-hmm. designed the logo. Cool, cool. Awesome, awesome. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you guys uh, all analog? My studio? Mm-hmm. It is for the most part. I mean, I have a, a digital setup, and 
I wouldn't say it's the greatest one in the world, but it, it works. Mm -hmm. I, and I'll, I'll use it more for mixing things out of if people bring digital tracks. Right. Then I'll mix through the console, through all the outboard gear. And I'll digitize master mixes uh, through a set of converters that are pretty nice RME converters uh, off of tape. And then they'll get sent off to whoever wants to master it. Sometimes mastering people will actually want the tapes. I think that if they have a tape machine, they like to work off tape. Really? But sending tape is an extra step. You know, you have to wrap it up and say, don't x-ray it. And they yeah. have to be put very it on the careful. Machine. You have to give them tones and they have to align their machine to it, which is just kind of how it used to be. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, yeah, I mean, the studio is, is analog. I've got a lot of analog recorders. I personally just like to do things that way. Mm -hmm. Is that just the whole reason you decided to? Just because of personal preference? Yeah. I mean, I started off doing four track cassette stuff like a lot of people do, and then got an eight track cassette at some point in the early 90s, and then came across a four track reel to reel and was playing with that. And then um, I had a studio in a basement, the basement of a friend of mine. His dad had died and his mom was alone, and she let us have the basement and we turned it into a studio called Fenland Sound. Mm. And uh, was doing some four track stuff down there. And then I got an ADAT, uh, old blackface ADAT, eight track, and had a studio based on that. And then got a second ADAT and had a studio based on ADATs for a while. But always, always wanted to, to, to work more with tape and ended up buying a two inch 24 track machine that it was more trouble than it was worth and ended up selling that but ended up finding more recorders and getting into eight track half inch and right. 16 track half inch and i've had just about every format now interesting and right now i've got quite a few tape recorders yeah yeah um now what other equipment is involved in like the analog side mainly just a bunch of tape and everything i guess by analog uh, more than anything it would what I think of analog as being is just a more discrete type circuitry in devices. So the, the preamplifiers that preamplify microphones will be made of individual components like a, like a, a capacitor, a resistor, mm -hmm. uh, a diode, you know, things that, that are like the signal path is, is sort of clean or Pure. I don't know how you would, how you would say it. Mm -hmm. And a lot, a lot of tube stuff. I have a lot of tube equipment, which you know, if you don't know the difference between tubes and transistors, you probably do. But a lot of people don't. You know, a tube is just an old like device, a vacuum tube, a vacuum mm -hmm. tube that would amplify a signal differently than a than a transistor would. But I don't have anything against transistors. I don't even have anything against digital stuff. Yeah, I think it sounds nice, and I've heard a lot of really great sounding digital recorders. I just personally am more interested in recording that way. So then it ends up through all the devices and the microphones. And a lot of my microphones are like, I like the SM7s. You've got one right there. I've mm -hmm. got several of those and uh, a lot of ribbon microphones, which is like a, an older style microphone that is a th really thin piece of aluminum stretched in, 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 in a magnet. And it has kind of a, you know it if you heard it. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of older recordings would have used ribbon microphones right. and all, all that ends up going through a mixing console and then to a multi-track tape either i work on 16 track two inch or one inch a track and then gets mixed down to a quarter inch two track or a half inch two track ah. and then i use things like tape echoes i've got a whole bunch of tape delays and analog delays and some digital stuff older digital stuff even tied Mm -hmm. processors and things like that cool now a lot of times like when musicians try and record their stuff like nowadays you know everyone's like diy and obviously mainly doing digital stuff you know if someone were to like start out doing like a lot of tape stuff is that really hard to learn or does it come fairly easy it's probably easier now with the internet i know yeah, you can, yeah, you can kind of ask everything. your phone just about any question that you'd ever have but if but there's a learning curve mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, there's so many things that can kind of go wrong with any machine, any machinery, you know, from threading the tape onto the machine, right. Mm -hmm. To making sure that the heads are clean, to making sure that the, the tape machine itself is aligned properly, which is sort of like each tape and tape formulation is different. So you have to sort of tell the circuits, the circuit, and you have to kind of manipulate it with uh, screwdrivers and test equipment to, to, optimize it for that tape hmm. 
sometimes it's cool if it isn't optimized for that tape you know sometimes the effect of having a, a machine that's not biased or set up right for a certain kind of tape can give a cool sound right hmm. interesting man that's crazy so it, so it is a little bit harder and tape also older tape can degrade and have problems like sticky shed problem which is uh, uh, a, a binder that they would use to to attach the little pieces of iron oxide to the actual f flexible polyester tape that binder that they used at a certain point in time has failed and the the it all comes off in a goo mm. you know put it on the machine and then it'll kind of slow down and oh, no. you'll notice that there's all this brown junk on the on the heads and it can it can be kind of a kick in the kick in the nuts or whatever yeah, to yeah. someone just trying to do something cool and they get so frustrated but anybody you want who if you work at it and keep doing it and overcome the the issues you'd probably be pleased right some people hate it and that's yeah, okay yeah. <laughs> that's okay some people hate it even when they're when their machines are when machines are great they just don't like it they don't like the sound they some don't people like getting fed up over digital too problems learning curve on that sometimes. oh yeah computers crashing and <laughs> yeah. things being missing and oh, glitching man. yeah now like if you get that goop do you run the risk of like damaging your machine too you have to mm, no it's pretty hard to damage the machine you okay. just have to get the goop off well, that's good. usually with your fingernail or i use like soft guitar picks to scrape it off if it gets on all the guides and stuff like that and you clean it with alcohol hmm. and then you can treat the tape with um i bake it i have a food dehydrator and you can stick it in a food dehydrator for a certain number of you know like a half hour hour depending on the thickness of the tape and sometimes you have to flip it let it cool down and then the tape will be good again and but it'll eventually degrade after a couple of months it'll start to have the problem again but there's another process so you can use this new finish process which i've never done but i'm going to mm -hmm. i'm going to set up a couple tape machines to do it and you take new finish this car polish like the same wax that you'd use on a car and you put it on pads like cotton pads or something and you set it up on the heads where the heads would go in the tape machine and you run the tape machine across this new finish back and forth a couple times and then you wipe it down and then supposedly that restores the tape to mm. usable condition forever Interesting. which is pretty cool because there's a lot of old stock tape that's unusable and kind of expensive um, and it can be saved if you if you take a little time yeah to do that so now in the digital age it's still fairly expensive to get tape it depends on what you think of as expensive I mean to me it's just an it's just an expense um, a new reel of like quarter inch tape that's decent tape might be somewhere between 30 and 50 bucks you know half inch tape maybe 75 80 bucks one inch tape 175 two inch tape can go up to 300 350 mm -hmm. depending on who you're buying it from and and what what grade because they're all you know different you know like they're super premium medium yeah just okay whatever has the price gone up like from in the past when more people were doing like tape stuff or is it like harder like maybe less people are making tape now i think adjusted for inflation it might be about the same but it's just not seen as it's just seen as maybe an added expense when mm -hmm. people are thinking about doing a record add 700 bucks to the project and they're you know it's like oh that's kind of a chunk of money <clears throat> for a band that's maybe making you know 125 bucks at a gig you know right. playing on a friday night opening for so and so and you know everybody's just working and trying to pay their bills i usually will end up renting tape or letting people use tape and i just say if you want to buy this tape from me you can but if you don't in a few months i might tape over it you know tape another yeah. project and you can tape on it over and over and over okay. again you just Unless something damages the tape or whatever, you can basically use it for as long as possible. A long time. Mm -hmm. You can you can tape over tape quite a few times. We got some like super old reels in your. Do I have any? Yeah. 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 I've What's got like quite your a oldest? few. <laughs> the oldest reels that I have laying around are probably from the '60s. Oh wow. I would say, and some of that stuff is acetate. It's like a different. It's a they used a different kind of tape. It's like a different different backing, and they. The, the way they got the oxide onto the tape was different and it wasn't back coated which is like a different manufacturing process that that tape lasts longer hmm. in some ways if it's stored right that tape has a tendency to dry out which is the opposite of modern 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 tape you want to keep it in a dry environment mm -hmm. and older tape you want to keep it in sort of like a humid environment hmm. you need a room with a dehumidifier and then one that's like a humidor or something <laughs> yep yeah 
That's crazy. Now, like the equipment itself <clears throat> that holds the tape and everything like that, all this different equipment you use, has that like become like like rare, like ooh, vintage, like gone up in price kind of thing too? It depends on what it is, but yeah. Yeah. Some t- some sometimes some machines are are not that valuable and some machines are really really valuable. Right now there's a um kind of resurgence in 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 analog tape with sort of audio files that they'll do these they'll <clears throat> they want two track quarter inch tape so they take it's like a quarter inch tape and divides it into two channels left and right going in one direction and they'll take a master source like a, a really really well done digital remaster of a certain album and it'll be something like uh steely dan asia you know it's like a, like a record that everybody or pink floyd dark side of the moon or something right. like that and they'll do these transfers to the tape and using all this really nice equipment and they'll, it's usually like side a is on one reel and side b is on another reel and they cost a lot of money they're like 400 bucks or mm. anywhere from three to six hundred bucks for them and then people will listen to them at at home in their super hi-fi setups with their tape machine you know and some people like to bypass all of the circuitry of the tape machine itself except for just the motors that they just use it as sort of like a way to spin the tape across the heads and then they mod the machine to get a feed straight off the playback head and they have separate preamps it's, they're like super high-end audiophile preamps just for listening to that and mm. i would guess that it sounds really 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 good uh, the people that are doing it are are probably people who have a bunch of extra money yeah and can sit around and just analyze probably different kinds of wire and stuff like that too uh, <laughs> you know? yeah 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 you know? man that's crazy and it sounds like you got it down to the science too and everything like there's like a real art to it there definitely is an art to it which is what i'm attracted to yeah it's kind of like a, a photographer still using a dark room and stuff right using, film, I, that's exactly that. what it is to me yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. different types of film and then you know creative uses of the camera how you're gonna you know adjust your f-stop and your aperture and your i don't know a lot about taking pictures but i know that my wife was a photographer for years and years and we had a bunch of darkroom stuff and mm. all these different processes that you'd use would affect the way things came out so doing working on tape is the same for better or for worse sometimes it ends up being bad sometimes i've ended you know i've accidentally recorded over something that we really didn't want to and had to redo it and then it ended up being something that was uh good Right or a, a happy accident. I sort of I, I my approach. One of the things I like about the analog approach is these uncontrollable variables. Mm-hmm. A lot of people want to control everything that's happening, but I think it's better to not be able to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, sort of the Brian Eno approach. And I remember reading, you know, listening to his music when I was a kid and reading about him. And I read a book about him that some person wrote for their some college thing. And, he developed these oblique strategies. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I don't think so. I want to get a deck of there. These cards they cost a lot of money. They're you know two 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 hundred fifty bucks or something, which is a lot for a deck of cards or something. But they're just these cards that you would keep in the studio that are sort of randomizing elements. So when you're working, you would if at a certain point you'd pull one of these cards and it would say something like, and I can't remember exactly what they'd say. Erase the last take the last thing you did oh, yeah. so no matter what it was like you'd be forced to if you were going to follow mm-hmm. the cards you'd have to do that and then you would do something or it'd say go outside and have a smoke or some other thing you know um, change the key um, grab the nearest keyboard and, yeah. and do an overdub with that keyboard yeah that's cool that's pretty interesting keeps things fresh you could change and if things it up. break that's, you know I, I, I think it's kind of fun when things break or sound weird you know that I've got a lot of equipment. Some of it's really high end and nice. I end up liking some of the real cheap, trashy sounding stuff, and some of the junky Japanese guitars that I have the most. You know, I've got a couple of really nice Gibson basses, and I have this just a piece of junk forty dollar Japanese um, Gibson bass copy mm. that was painted by someone with red house paint. <laughs> with a help with a brush oh man but i like that bass like i would sell my gibsons i would keep that bass yeah it has this certain kind of weird it's kind of it's uh kind of more rare <laughs> it is more unique <laughs> it is but it's got some kind of mojo to it that right technically is not you know great but has something yeah yeah 
Yeah, it seems like you like the weird stuff, and you like a challenge and everything when it comes to your work. So yeah, that's very cool. I do. I think it's. I think it's kind of fun. I think it's fun to 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 have strange things happening. Yeah, and more hands-on too, and all this and that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, and I I have these Ampex machines. I got into Ampex because and Ampex is a manufacturer, American manufacturer that made tape machines in the '50s. One of the first companies that did it. And uh, they made a lot of video stuff too, but they and they 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 adapted the two inch videotape transport to audio, and mm. it's America going forever about it. But these machines are they're sort of like they're they're very simple. The ones that I have, which are AG four forties, I have an eight track one inch machine, and then a quarter quarter inch two track machine, and then I have a whole bunch of other machines that I need to work on or whatever. But the eight track is actively being used, and so is the the two track. Um, they're very simple. They don't have a counter. They, you, you don't know where you are on the tape. You know, you have to just kind of like get used to where you might be, or put a piece of tape on the reel and mark with a pen where, where, where the song starts and stops. So they're a little bit harder to use, and that can affect the flow of a session. But the sound of them is really, really incredible. Yeah. They just have like a certain. I don't know what it is. The way they made them. It they just has this warm kind of. It's not accurate. It's definitely curved. Like things aren't. They come when they come back off the machine. Even when you're recording through the machine before you recorded, it does something to the sound. Oh. And then when you mix down from this eight track to this two track, it's like another layer of that. Interesting. How old are those? The eight track is from maybe seventy three. And then the two track that I have is late '60s model, '60 or '69. And it's funny, I got it from um, Garth Brooks' studio. Oh, really? And a friend of mine, who I met through this other tape, manu- tape machine manufacturer, 3M Income, which is 3M, like the company that everybody knows about. For a long time, they made tape machines hmm. and tape. And there was, I had, I had a 3M, and I was in this group that you know everyone talked about 3Ms or whatever. And then one time, I was talking to him about uh, my interest in Ampex. I was like, I got this Ampex 8 track from someone. I didn't really even want it at the time I bought it. It was just kind of like it was big and heavy. And the guy was like, you buy all this stuff and take this too because I just got to get it out of my house. And I was like, okay. And then I started playing with it and listening to it and realized that that Ampex machine was uh, the sound that I'd heard on so many different recordings. And I started like, you know, now you can just on your phone just sit there and just look up records and where it was recorded and the time it was recorded and look at that studio at that time and be like, oh yeah, that was an Ampex machine. That was an MM-1000 or an AG-440 or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I got into these Ampexes and my friend down in Nashville uh, manages Allentown Sound, which is Garth Brooks' studio. He's like, well, I think we have some of those in the basement. And he's like, you wanna come down and get them? And I was like, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. So a friend of mine and I jumped in the bin and he had another friend that had some more Ampex stuff. So it was like an Ampex run. I was grabbing all these tape machines that were probably gonna get thrown away. Yeah, yeah. And um, Matt, the guy that I got it from, s- said, I'll have to ask Garth what he wants for him. He's like, he won't want much. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. So I got there and I got everything. And I was like, so what, what's the deal? What are, you, what are you needing? And he said, Garth says, uh, just send, or give us a $50 gift tip kit to Taco Bell for <laughs> the crew to eat lunch. I was like, that's it? Taco He's Bell, like, huh? Taco Bell. Yeah. I was like, okay. So <laughs> I didn't know, didn't didn't do it then. He's like, oh, not even fifty dollars, like yeah. specifically Taco Bell, it's a Taco Bell gift certificate. So I came back and I went to the Taco Bell on Thirtieth Street in Rock Island, and I went in and I was like, I need a gift certificate, and they were like, what? And like nobody buys gift <laughs> certificates. The only ones they had were Christmas ones, with all these little snowmen and stuff on them, and I was like, oh, I'll work. Yeah. <laughs> so Man. I mailed it down. Yeah. Merry Christmas to you. Right. Get all this new equipment. <laughs> yeah. I needed work. They that that I had to re you know, change capacitors and change mm. a couple components in it and do a bunch of stuff to it, but it's working. I you just learned how it. to replace everything just from tinkering with these things for so long? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah I mean uh, it, at a certain point you have to. I mean when you have a lot of stuff um and it breaks, then you have to fix it or you have to be at the mercy of someone to help you fix it. And yeah. I don't fix everything myself. I I've been I, I know a few people who can fix things really well. And I, I'll come to a point where I can't do it, or it just is beyond me, and right. I pass it off to them. And I'm lucky that I have a couple of people who are just really, really, really smart. Yeah, that's good. Elect- I'm learning right now. That's kind you of like, like stand over and watch them every time when they. As much as I have time for, I'm actually really kind of right now. My my primary interest is 
learning more about electronics like learn like beyond the knowledge that i have which is i'm kind of like a high level hack you know really understanding cir the circuitry and mm -hmm. what the components do the history of tubes and transistors and, and electricity and you know uh, someone that that I've been working with that's been fixing stuff for me kind of started talking about this stuff you know about you know how electricity is conducted and how how atomic structure you know al allows for certain electrons to be used and so certain things are better conductors and some things are not conductors and some things are semiconductors and all, you know, all these things start, start making sense it's like oh yeah a semiconductor you've heard about a semiconductor a lot well, it's a it's a material that will conduct, but doesn't want to. But yeah. it's useful in circuits because you can use it to to amplify signal or to switch switch electricity, and then all those little things sort of like z you zoom out and they they go into an artistic realm where right. you know these the way things are made sort of affect the way they sound, and yeah. and you can hear the sound that's being made in the studio, and then know the sound that the device is going to make. And put those things together yeah yeah kind of getting that like scientific background in a sense so then you can see everything it comes like full circle get that broad understanding right. i guess so i mean there's there's the whole you know layers and levels of of that you know between you know like what are the lyrics saying how does this person feel there's psychology involved in recording where how you can tell when someone walks in how they're feeling that day you gotta kind of figure out if they're if they're booked the time and they maybe don't want to be there or they're having a bad day you got to figure out how to quickly get them into the mode of doing what they're there to do and then think about what you're trying to do you know the the sound that they want to make mm -hmm. and then make that sound come out so that they're pleased with it and it fits with everything that's happening right right that's really nice you're very really, like thoughtful as far as the musicians too as far as like how they're i try to be yeah yeah that's i mean good. i'm a musician and played in bands and i work i've recorded in studios a lot and I always sort of enjoyed the studio, but never really got results that I liked that much in the studios I was in when I was doing it. Uh -huh. But I think I'd just because of different people's approach. Yeah. And me not being able to s describe what I want. Yeah. And maybe it's people who are doing the recordings not knowing why I would want it. You know, yeah, sometimes yeah, yeah. it's hard to say, uh, I, want, I don't want it to sound that nice. I want it to sound this way. Yeah. So is that like just from playing music yourself, is that what made you want to go more hands on like recording, having your own recording studio in a sense? Or were you like even interested in it when you were like younger? Like I was interested kid? in recording before I was interested. I was always interested in music, but I was always interested in recording. Uh, my dad, who gave me very few things in my life, even my parents were divorced and he was in Oregon for in California and so he wasn't around, but gave me a little mono cassette recorder when I was a kid uh -huh. you know just one of those little radio shack things it's kind of a rectangle and uh, you know you can talk into it and record things but I played with that thing forever and I would do things like you know hold it up to the TV and record songs off the TV or you know songs off the radio I didn't understand that, that connecting something to a stereo I would just hold it up to the speaker the, the little yeah, yeah. microphone up to the speaker and then I could make tapes of songs that I liked and then play the tapes back. They probably sounded horrible. Yeah. Yeah, you know, me and my buddies, like, we kind of started like that when we were young. We had, like, some old shitty, like, yeah, rectangle, like, just little cassette recorder, and that's basically what we did. We just sit there and just play, like, some acoustic stuff or whatever. And, and then you could take two, and you could record, make that, and then play it through the speaker and play along. I would do mm. that, too, with a boom box and another mm. boom box, you know? You nice, record nice, something yeah. when back when boom boxes had microphones on them. And right. Hell yeah. How old were you when you got that uh, mono? That recorder? recorder? Yeah. Uh, I was probably seven or eight years old, maybe. Cool, cool. Were you into like, so you were into playing instruments at that time too? I was just getting into playing instruments. I liked music and I wanted to play music. I think I had just like a real cheesy air organ. I don't even think it probably was in the trash somewhere in the neighborhood. I don't even remember where it came from. Yeah. It was like you'd plug it in, you hear the fan running mm. and it would play chords automatically mm. and kind of, you'd hit the note and it would slowly play this sort of like accordion sounding thing and I had I would play write little songs on that and then I wanted to play guitar and one of my cousins gave me a guitar I had like three strings it's a piece of junk <laughs> and then that's I didn't add any strings to it yeah, but I would sit around and play it and I was probably I might have been 12 11 12 and then I wanted to play bass so I got a bass over at Griggs Music mm -hmm. put it on layaway 
you know, got money here and there, and eventually got it. What kind of base was it? Fender Mustang base. Oh, okay, nice. Red with a white stripe, so I should have kept it. I didn't, but yeah. it was a cool base. Had to go find one again. I had no amp for, I think, maybe another year, and I got a cheap little Tysco amp from a friend of mine that got a new trainer amp. So mm-hmm. he was like, well, you can have my old Tysco. It's a piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it started with guitar a bit and then kind of bass for you? Bass and then then guitar again. Yeah, yeah. Then I got more into yeah, guitar. Like a, a nice guitar at some point? <laughs> I got a decent guitar, yeah. I had an Ibanez. Um, it was like a double cutaway. It was a Flying Fingers. I don't know if you know what those are. Like a 70s. Uh, it's sort of like a Les Paul, kind of like a cross between an, an SG and a Les Paul. Okay. And I, uh, I just... All, all I really wanted to do was figure out how to play Rush songs. I just I was obsessed with Rush. Yeah. Uh, when I was when I was a kid, for years, and I and I got a Rush complete songbook, and I would just look at the chord, the little chords. I never played lead. I still can't play lead, but I would I would look at the chord and I figure out, oh yeah, the arpeggios he's doing are like based on the chord. So I kind of learned how to play guitar through Rush. Cool, cool. Some people say I look like Getty Lee. I don't know, maybe. Maybe a blonde Getty Lee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's really cool. Do you play anything else? or? Uh, guitar and bass. I can play keyboards. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a keyboard player. But I like key- synthesizers. I have a lot of synthesizers. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of electric pianos and pianos. I think I currently have three acoustic pianos, and I don't know how many synths. 50, yeah. 60. Really? But I'll, I'll just learn a part. I can play key- keyboards as long as I need to. I'll learn a part, and then I'll you know, kind of get muscle memory for the part yeah. long enough to record it, and then it's gone. Right. Um, that's another thing that can be really valuable, certain synth- uh, old synthesizers, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love them. Yeah, yeah. You know, even if it's just for one sound. The, la- the last Multiple Cat record that I did, I set out to use as many of my keyboards as I could. One of my friends kind of gave me a hard time, and it's like... <laughs> You don't even play these things. They're just like laying around. And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh, I play them. I'm, I'm gonna take one of these. I'm gonna pull one out and I'm gonna find the sound for the song, and put it in there somewhere, nice. even if it's just like way underneath something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Utilize all that you have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now I've seen some. I've never been to your studio, but I've seen like some pictures like online. I know you got like a pretty big room there with all mm-hmm. the instruments and stuff. Is that ba- uh, mainly where you record in the big one room, or do you yeah. have like separate booths too? Or I don't have any separate booths. Cool, cool. Yeah. I mean. You, I've thought about, I kind of insulated all the walls so that the rooms themselves could be used for that. And I've thought about putting patch panels in, but I've never really needed to. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of people playing together. Ironically, when I do recording, it's almost always overdubbing one thing or another. But when I'm recording someone else's music, I encourage them to play together as much as they can. Mm -hmm. And then since I'm using a lot of ribbon microphones, you you can turn them in certain directions because there's usually a place where they don't pick up you can kind of strategically place things and move the microphone so that there's not as much bleed mm-hmm. i don't really worry about bleed I, I worry about phasing a little bit which is when signals cancel each other out because of the way they're hitting the microphones at certain times but it's pretty much just in one room mm-hmm. and i try not to use headphones if people really really want to use them when they're doing overdubs they kind of have to right. but when they're recording live i i st- I don't, I don't have any hard and fast rules where I say you can't do this or you can't do that. I say, I think you'd be more comfortable if you just heard each other. Right. Even if they're doing a, you know, scratch track, I'll put it through some speakers. And that's how I did all the day trotter stuff when, hmm. when, day, when day trotter was, when I was doing that. Cool, cool. Rather than having headphones, just have it be through monitors, kind of like you do at practice. Were you doing all their live sessions or? In uh, the, the first two years I did all the sessions. Okay. Except for, there were a few that were done by my friend Brad. And he continued to kind of sporadically do stuff. And then uh, I left full time in 2008 and then started freelancing for them after that. And then Mike Gentry ended up being the full time engineer after that. Cool. Now, do you get a lot of musicians or bands coming to you specifically like, oh, I want to do like, you know, an analog album, basically? They want sometimes they want to use your equipment and stuff. Sometimes Um, it's kind of weird because some a lot of people just don't really even understand it. I don't understand it. Like they don't even understand. I'm I'm sort sort of surprised that I'm having to explain. Like no, these are indi- like on the multi-track tape. Like these are individual instruments on these tracks. Like here's the voice and here's the what. And they're like trying to explain the process. So a, a, a lot of people aren't that aware of it. 
some people are so and eh, it's maybe maybe half and half I yeah think. uh i i feel like the 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 equipment that's there and the approach is something that I'm interested in, but I don't know how many people are, other people are interested in it. Mm-hmm. I'm not that busy. I don't try to be, I don't hustle. I'm not like a big social media person and, and I, I could be, but I, I don't have a strong interest in it. Like I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, but I don't, I don't have that feeling. Like I don't, I don't, not against it, but I don't have that feeling. Like, like I don't want to, I don't want to have to hustle and promote and whatever. Like booked full time and everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I get booked, I mean, there were times when I was working for day trotter where I was so busy, I could, you know, barely see straight. And I, and I really hated the studio mm. and I'm almost afraid of ha- ever hating it again. Yeah. yeah. I, I really like it. Turns into like a job. Basically. You, can, you can, you can burn out quickly. Yeah. Right now I work, you know, anywhere from three to 10 days a month in the studio and okay. that's pretty good. Yeah. I don't mind doing that. I read these books by old engineers because I I love all these old records and and people, you know, that Ken Scott, who worked with the Beatles, or Phil Brown, who's done all these different recordings, or Jeff Emmerich, you know, another Beatles guy. Um, And they talk about how how many, they just lived in the studio 60 hours a week. They never slept. They just did coke or whatever and, (laughs) you know, kept going. Right. You know, that, that stuff fascinates me. I could never do it. I'd burn out. Yeah. That would be really intense. Like, yeah, plus my wife wouldn't like it. I mean, she's <laughs> and I've got two young kids right now. Right, right. One older kid who's out of the house and you know, the building that the studio's in is is a building that I own, so I maintain that and and I have my house and other stuff to do. Right, right. Staying busy and staying all outside. kinds of different ways. I like to be outside if the weather's good. And being in the studio, it's it's really depressing. If it's if it's a nice like seventy eight degree day with you know just great weather, and you're locked in there for ten hours, it's, yeah, like, it's man, pretty depressing. Too bad we can't have an open air studio, but we just can't do it. <laughs> I've done that. Really? Yeah. Well, not exactly. I've done overdubs outside. Yeah. It's pretty interesting sounding. Really? Just get yeah. a lot of uh, like nature sounds or whatever in the background. Well. The one time that really stands out that we did it uh, was when I was recording a Tripmaster Monkey record in the 90s, and we had this whole building. It's called the Slow Fish Building. It's down on downtown Davenport, and we had access to the whole place. So we re- just ran all these mic cables up to the roof and did some vocal overdubs on the roof, and I think some percussion or drum overdubs. There's just no acoustic space at all. Hmm. It's a different sounding thing because there's it's it's not like a dead room it's not like a live room. There wasn't a lot of bleed from other things. It just had this sort of immediate, almost like, like direct sound. Did you like it a lot? Not enough to keep doing it all the time. Yeah. But it was pretty interesting. And we, and we had a, a you know, Warner Brothers record budget so we could afford to screw around and do stuff like that. Hmm. Nice. You know, it'd be hard to tell a band, hey, let's spend, you know, two hours trying this. And you might like it or might not like it or whatever, yeah. you know. Well, any other weird things you've tried like that or odd things? Um, I guess it depends on what you think of as odd. I guess the only thing I would think of as odd maybe would be when things are wrong, leaving them wrong. You know, like yeah. something's something's not working right, but it sounds kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Just letting it be, yeah, broken. Yeah, yeah. There's certain artists that prefer that too. Sometimes, just like a raw take or whatever. Mm-hmm. Some people, some artists, they'll like, ah, yeah, they just do all my stuff in one take. Like if they prefer it. Yeah. Cool. But <laughs> well, that that song, um, I don't know if you know the song "Jet" by Wings. Ah, uh, yeah. When I, I read so. that Jeff Emmerich book, he talked about the tape. And they were doing all these takes over and over of that song. It was a really big radio hit. And the tape was, he, he, they, they finally got this take. And it was, all the energy was there. And everything's fantastic. And he's looking at the reels. And he's seeing the oxide. And like I was talking about, the, you know, the, the binder failing. And in, the, in this case, it was like something like the, the oxide that holds the actual signal onto the tape was falling off, like in chunks. And yeah. Paul McCartney was like, that's, the, that's it. That's the take. It's fantastic. And then, and then Jeff Hammer was like, oh, I know, I don't think we can do that. This is a, this, this is tape is trashed. And he's like, nope, that's it. That's done. 
So they quickly transferred that to another good tape and then ended up using it. But if you listen to that song, Jet, and know that, then you can hear this all of a sudden. It's like, oh, yeah, this is really trashy sounding. Uh. It's got this compressed kind of thin strange sound and things are kind of going out and coming back in and they try to compensate for it when they were mixing but it ended up making the song cool and the take the energy of the take was there Mm -hmm. so it all kind of came together so when those things happen i try to just be like okay that's cool go with that right right yeah something strange is happening but we're just going to keep moving right i like that yeah things that you don't expect Mm -hmm. or whatever gives it a new feel changes it up keeps it a little fresh but unplanned yeah um even the same like i do like some video work sometimes sometimes you like kind of storyboard a video or get this idea in your head and it's like it turned out like you thought it did like the the way you thought you had it planned but then at the same time it's like completely different and it's like that's ah, perfect though mm-hmm. <laughs> even though you didn't really necessarily plan all that but mm-hmm. yeah it's really cool um who are some of your other big uh influences as far as uh, music or uh, engineers or anything Music or engineers? <clears throat> um, you're talking about old stuff? Nah, it could or, be whatever. Um, I mean, I like a lot of different kinds of music, and I have a lot of records, and I've gone through periods of things, I guess, you know, like everybody does. You know, you kind of yeah. get into something. I mean, the, f- the first band that I can remember being really, really, really obsessed by was Rush. Um, but, and, uh, uh, and then after that, U2 which their first three albums to me are still some of the best records ever made. And Steve Lillywhite, who did those records, is a really great producer. Like the, those albums, if you've ever heard them, they, they sound, I'm shocked now like how many people totally write off YouTube because after that they kind of started doing a lot of cheesy stuff in my opinion, and mm-hmm. this rattle and hum and like this goofy movie and, and then, you know, Akatung Baby and the BB King stuff, which is like, I don't understand what all that is. But those first three records are fantastic. Mm-hmm. And Steve Lillywhite had these just really great acoustic spaces and these really big drum sounds and really cool delays that would go in your, if you had the earphones on, you know. My uncle gave me the album War when I was a kid. He was like, oh, you might like this. He gave me The Police and Yada Mandata and The Clash London Calling and U2 War. And he's like, you might like these tapes. And I listened to him like, driving back from Kansas to home yeah. over and over again on a Walkman and really got into into the, the way those U2 records sound. Um, but then I got into uh, more sort of avant-garde music, maybe in the later 80s, got really into 4AD stuff, which at the time was Cocteau Twins. I was really obsessed with the Cocteau Twins for a while. They're kind of a ethereal, shoegazy sounding band. and. Um, other 4AD stuff like Throwing Muses, early music. My friends would always sort of accuse me of being too focused on a certain band or a certain sound. I, mean, I got into American grunge stuff like Super Chunk, like pop, 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 pop grungy stuff, not so much the West Coast stuff, but mm-hmm. more like the Merge Records stuff. Um, Pixies and um, Wire. Wire is a band that is from you know 70s and 80s and is still putting out records that has always been one of my favorite bands. Oh, nice. If you ever listen to them very much, they have a lot of different sounds and eras. Like they were a band for three records, they they broke up, and they were really they went from kind of different punk, to, you know British punk to to really avant garde stuff by their third album 154, and then they broke up and then they put out another album called The Ideal Copy in 1987 which a friend of mine gave me on a tape one time and said, you might like this, it kind of sounds like New Order. And I like New Order and Joy Division and the English and Manchester stuff. Um, and uh, I got into that, that Wire record, and to this day, it's still one of my favorite records of all time. And this guy named Gareth Jones produced it. And I got to meet Wire for Day Trotter, I recorded them. Oh, and really? talked to Colin Newman, who's the singer, about them. And he said, oh, that 80s stuff, everybody hates it. And he made a sign. He, he was like, they think, oh, no, keep away from that. It's bad, <laughs> bad stuff. I was like, not to me. They were doing all this stuff. It's it really interesting to hear about because they, they had a 24-track tape machine, and they were syncing it up to, to um, MIDI devices and then running all these keyboards and all these effects with Simpty time code on the tape machine. And they said it was a nightmare to make this record. And when, when he said that, I was like, that must be why it's so good. 
it was so weird and so hard and they were having to do all these weird little things t- to make it to make it work mm-hmm. um the wire wires are really 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 influ- influential band i would say i think their their lyrics are really really cool yeah but i buy a lot of records now um I, I find myself buying a lot of female indie rock type stuff. Um, I don't know why. I, I didn't even really notice it till recently. I was like, wait a minute. Almost wait, everything I'm listening to <laughs> is all these like <laughs> sort of like Australian female singers and doing sort of sugary-ish pop. Weird, weird sounding pop, but, you know. Nice. Yeah, I got to change it up. Keep it. Yeah. Producers, though, um, I mean, I like I like Brian Eno's ideas. I don't always like all his production. Um, he seems some some of the Talking Head stuff that he's done, I think, is cool. But I think more of his philosophy about music is a little more interesting than mm-hmm. the results that he actually gets. What's his philosophy? Kind of the things I was talking about that. Um, uh, sort of stepping out of the way yeah, yeah. of the process and being trying to be sort of psychological about it and then approaching the not being rigid about equipment, you know, not being, you know, not saying, oh, things have to be perfect. Things have to be a certain way. Like, and v- viewing uh, unforeseen limitations as being helpful. Mm-hmm. Like if a keyboard all of a sudden he is famous for having a, a Yamaha DX7 synthesizer that doesn't work half of it doesn't work it mm. continues to use it hmm. and it keeps breaking more and it keeps using <laughs> it because the keyboard is sort of saying what it will give you now you know and, yeah, and yeah. like the equipment sort of saying here's what i'll do you know this is our, re- our relationship not everything some things you have to fix and make them work or whatever but mm-hmm. just approaching things that way i remember just reading about that kind of stuff and thinking that was really cool yeah, because you know you sort of get an idea of how you're supposed to do recordings, and it's you know with these number of mics on the drums, and you're supposed to isolate everything. And if you hear a little bit of bass in the snare drum mic, that's bad. And you know not getting away from that, and not worrying about bleed and um, s- some mistakes happening. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's sort of a good thing. Yeah, and there's yeah. lots of lots of older recordings that have mistakes in them. Lots of famous recordings that have splices. You can hear where they had to cut the tape to cut a couple takes together, or they had a failure. You know, big songs, Led Zeppelin songs, Rolling Stones songs, Beatles songs. Or even like changing things at like the last minute. Like, isn't that what the Beatles did with Helter Skelter? Supposedly, from what I remember yeah. hearing, it was like all slow and easy or whatever. And then I they, could see that. I don't know. That they decided to do the take like all really intense and all that. But it worked. Yeah. <laughs> timeless basically but yeah they would do a lot of takes yeah yeah and that's the other thing as an artist like if you're chasing perfection in the studio you're gonna be there for years sometimes <laughs> like you know yeah so many like thousands of takes or whatever you know i think they're like. chasing feel and i think that's what i'm sort of interested in too mm. is chasing feel the perfection i'm not so worried about yeah yeah but you know you can you can record a great song on that little recorder i got when i was seven and it'll be a great song but you can take a crappy song and use the greatest equipment in the world and it's going to be a crappy song. Yeah, yeah, true. You know, not played well or whatever, you know, when the vibe is there, the vibe is there. Yeah, I like that philosophy for sure. That's dope. Yeah. Um, now what, uh, do you do all different kinds of genres? Record all different kinds of genres? I do. Yeah? Cool. What's your uh, favorite? Do you have a particular? What's, what's my favorite kind of music to do? To record anyway? Well, my favorite kind of music that I would like to be recording would be sort of strange, angular, um, pop, mathy pop type stuff. Yeah. There's a band called Omni that a friend of mine, they're a current band from Atlanta that turned me on to them a a while ago um, that I like a lot. And they're sort of like Devo, early Devo, kind of like just herky jerkies. They're kind of like Wire too, in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. You know that this sort of strange. I like things that are strange. It doesn't really matter what it is. That's what I personally like. If it's if it's country and weird, great. If it's R and B and weird, great. Yeah, yeah. You know when it's really straightforward and not going for anything that's a little bit twisted, then I'm not as interested in it. But. Yeah. It doesn't really matter to me as long as people want to be creative 
you know mm-hmm. what what i personally you know listen to the most is is probably just strange indie rock mm-hmm. you know not super heavy some stuff maybe a little bit heavy but just off kilter unknown mortal orchestra i don't know if you know that band i like that band quite you said a bit. what was the name unknown mortal orchestra huh their first couple of records are really good they're just strange this music that you're going how the hell did how did they think this up like where did it come from nice you know uh, when did they come around uh i know more mortal orchestra has probably been around 10 years or so maybe okay cool they've put out f- five records nice. but i mean yeah i've ended up recording all kinds of stuff do you uh currently still make uh music for yourself no well mm-hmm. i haven't i i kind of pushed it away from my brain because i just had too much other stuff to do Mm-hmm. And uh, I was playing live and playing in the band, playing in Multiple Cat, and doing that for a few years, back from 2012 to maybe 2016, pretty actively. Mm-hmm. And it was fun, but kind of thinking to myself at the same time, like, this might be the last time I'm kind of doing this. Yeah. Because I'm, you know, I got these young kids, they're getting into middle school, and, you know, I'm still gone doing other stuff a lot, but I can't be gone that much. Right. You right. know what I mean? I can't just be gone. We did a couple of and... tours and we're doing shows and yeah, you know, to maintain a marriage and maintain the house and right. all that other stuff. So I pushed it away from my brain because if, if I, if I start to think about writing music, then I'll, I'll, I'll do it all the way. I'll go all the way in. Mm-hmm. So I've had a couple of little ideas, but I just don't have time. I may sometime soon. Have you uh, always done it with when you were making music? Was it always with a band or did you ever do solo stuff? A combination, mostly solo stuff, but it would kind of revolve around some people who wanted to do it at the moment. So Multiple Cat was always like a revolving door of of whoever was sort of available and wanted to to sort of do it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there were collaborations that, that were back and forth between members, but usually it was just me writing songs. And mm-hmm. there's a couple of multiple cat songs that were written by other people and recorded. Our, our drummer Jason Williams sang and wrote a couple songs that ended up on a record. Cool, cool. Some riffs that people wrote ended up, excuse me, on records. Nice. Um, when you were making music, was it? Are you making a lot of the music that you like to listen to, like the weird stuff, weird pop stuff? I think it's avant-garde. weird pop. Yeah. I think it's pretty weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man. I mean. Um, it's not totally far out, like you know, free jazz or something like that. But it's it's definitely weird. it's it's weird enough that not many people like it. You know, it's not like, never been a million seller kind of thing. <laughs> There's a few people who seem to really like like it, and I'll get an email once in a while from someone. I had someone asking me about lyrics to a song. I feel bad I haven't responded, <laughs> but I tried to listen to the song and figure out what the lyrics were, and I'm like, I have no idea. I, don't, <laughs> I remember writing them down, yeah, yeah, and I don't know. It's so you're gonna to have to interpret it yourself, right? Yeah, and I, I understand where the question came from. Once I tried to figure <laughs> it out myself, I was like, "Yeah, I don't know." What song was that? Do you remember? Nebula is a song, Nebula, which is sort of like a proggy calypso sounding song, which sounds really strange, but that's really what it was. Yeah, and it ended up being sort of about um, nebula, uh, nebulous things which don't make they're they're unclear so i think that's what the whole song was kind of about there's no no connection between the no solid subject it was just all sort of free association or something like that but also sort of slurred and the lyrics or the vocals are buried a little bit so mm-hmm. it's hard to understand it yeah yeah um so you said you guys do like uh you've done you release cds and like you've done vinyl did you do any cassettes ever or no but i want to yeah uh well no we did tapes i i the the first multiple cat st- stuff was on cassettes that i dubbed myself cassettes are getting uh, really popular again yeah among some people i like them yeah i like the way they sound i like the artifact and they're not expensive yeah if you can't afford vinyl i would do tape yeah I'm do I just did, actually just finished a project with a friend of mine called Silver Paint and he he had a publishing deal um 
with uh, a company where you know he would make he would write they would take the lyrics off the vocals off of your songs and they'd put them in sell them to people you know commercials and whatever yeah, he got yeah, a yeah. he got one on teen mom and mtv's teen mom it was a long time ago and he got a bunch of money nice. so he had this idea seven or eight years ago he's like we should make a record you and me because he's in a band called track a tiger which is on future apple tree and um really good kind of pop stuff it's kind of synthy down tempo pop stuff and i mixed a lot of his stuff so we wanted to make this record together where he we he kind of wrote most of the ideas and then I wrote the lyrics and I tried to sound like someone else. Like I was trying to sing like Bowie and I was trying to sing like another person, like pretend I was somebody else. That was our goal. And then but the whole point was that we'd take these vocals off and then he'd try to sell the music to this publishing place and maybe we'd make some money. But yeah. they didn't like the they didn't want it. So we never made <laughs> any money. And we kinda of shelved it. And then recently um, he was like, you know, that stuff's not that bad. We should, we should redo it. And I was like, I want to redo the vocals. And he said, great. So I just redid them. I was like, I just, I'm going to sing as myself. So I did that and we have it done. We have it mastered and we're going to put it out. And, and I'm insisting on cassette. And he's, he's sort of not into it. He's like, why the hell would anybody listen to a cassette? And I'm like, because they're great. They're they great. will though. They're really cool. Yeah, I do. I mean, give a cassette with a download. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can download the digital and you can listen to it that way and then have the actual artifact. Of, I love I love looking at things. I love looking at tapes and looking at records and reading yeah. reading the little information on them. Yeah, yeah. Um and depending who you talk to, it's like some people are like that ah, CDs is dumb, uh, but then, you know, they want like vinyl or something or something like cassette too. Yeah, cuz it's like it's like cool now, you know, the vintage thing kind of coming back a bit. Well, it has a sound yeah i mean that tape is really thin it's like you know an eighth inch thick or wide and very thin there's not a lot of material on it and it's moving really slow it's like one in seven eight zips which is like if you look at the reels they're they're not going very fast so the faster a tape goes the wider it is and the thicker it is the higher fi it is okay so it's pretty amazing that they're able to make tapes sound as good as they do yeah but they still kind of compress the sound and do something to it and it kind of has this effect. Oh, that reminds me, you're talking about producers. This guy had died, Richard Swift. You ever heard of Richard Swift? I might have heard the name. I think he I'm died just, just last fall, maybe. Uh, he's put out, he, he recorded a bunch of stuff, a bunch of other people's records, and put out a bunch of his own records. And uh, I got to record him one time in Austin when I was with Day Trotter down there, and it was amazing. It was, it was an, it was, he's just, he's, he was a genius. Unfortunately, he was also like, kind of a heavy drinker and mm. ended up dying at age 40 oh, or something. But at the last step in his process, I was reading this article in this magazine called Tape Op, which is a really cool magazine and it's free. Everybody should get it because all you have to do is like sign up for it and they'll start showing up at your house. Really? Tape Op, yeah. Uh, um, that he would take his finished records, however he recorded them, whatever process he used, the last thing he would do is transfer them to a Tascam 424 four track cassette to two tracks of it which is basically what you get when you're listening to a regular cassette you're only using half half of that little tape is your side a and the other half is side b or it's kind of staggered so it's like one and three and two and four i don't know if that makes sense but he would transfer the final mix to the cassette and send that to the mastering house to make the final product mm -hmm. So whatever that was, whatever record it was going to be, and there's some big records like this Lucius record that he did that was done that way, or uh, Foxygen's first record. I don't know if you've heard of that band. Yeah, I've heard of them. Cayucas, yeah. um, that's his deal. That's like what he does, and it was it was really cool to hear that because I'm like, and then the mastering engineer would have to kind of fight that in a way, you know, he'd have to sort of say, well, I got this teeny little tape moving really slow. Uh, I gotta make this sound as good as I can, and but it has a sound, and it sounds great. But then now you get these tapes that you buy, and they still sound great. Yeah. You can take a great record and put it on a tape, and let's put it in a, a tape deck or a boombox, and it's oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And it's cheap. I mean, they're not that right. much. I mean, to make a hundred tapes is like two hundred fifty bucks or something like that. Ain't I mean, bad. It's, <laughs> it's not much money. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any? Uh any bucket list shit you'd like to do as far as certain artists you'd like to work with or record? I don't. No? No. I mean, I, I, when I was working for Day Trotter, I, wor I, I recorded a lot of bands that I really liked and had liked for a long time. 
and it got to a point where people would come in and it I wouldn't say it wasn't a thrill but it was sort of like it, it, it became a different feeling it was like oh you get, to, you get to realize that all these people are just people yeah and they're doing you know their thing whatever it is they're doing they're smoking a cigarette or they're you know really hungry and asking for some kind of food or whatever or they're making a joke about something or they're sick and they have a cold you know like they're just people like doing stuff so you, it's it's just a the expectations about what that would be are are really different mm. i mean if anybody wanted to to do a recording i would say sure let's do it but uh i've recorded a lot of bands that i really really like and had been buying records by way before i ever recorded them and and also a lot of bands that I that ended up being that getting bigger later, you know. So yeah. I've been around all that stuff, and it's kind of like a, it's neat, but it's it's not going to be any neater. Yeah. You know. Right. <laughs> I wanted to record Rush. Oh, they played man. it I Wireless, and um, I was like, you gotta get them. They they won't do that. They won't yeah. Do anything like yeah. That. I mean, they're cool, but they're just they're just done with that. Mm. You know, they're they're done with doing stuff like that. So right. Right. That yeah. would that would have that would have been a really big deal. But when I, when I was recording wire, I, 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 I realized and remember, you know, talking to the, talking to them, these are people that I never thought I'd ever even have a chance to probably see in concert, much less have in my studio and be recording them and, uh, you know, talking to them about things. But I was thinking back to when I was a teenager listening to their a bell is a cup record, which came out in, I think 88, and a friend of mine and I were obsessed with this record. We had just, or ta- it was on tape actually. We'd drive around in the car listening to it on tape. And one time, like, um, hopped the fence at Duck Creek Golf Course, got some golf clubs from his dad or something, and hopped the fence at six in the morning. We were still up on some drug or some <laughs> acid or something. And, yeah. and, you know, we went up to, started hitting golf balls and playing golf. And some guy came up and, um, uh, said something to us he's like he's like you guys aren't supposed to be out here you're not golfing we're like yeah we are he's like i saw your footprints you came from the fence i saw them go over the fence i see your footprints in the dew no i'd be like no some dude just came through it was and he's like you better get out of here so we took off jumped the fence we got back in the car and that tape was still in there but as i was recording them i was thinking about this i was like oh yeah i was like 17 years old and now here i am with this band in my studio (laughs) you know that i never would have ever thought that I would be doing this. And it was yeah. a cool feeling. Yeah. But I don't know how you'd top it. You right, know, right. You know? You've already done all the cool stuff. Now. I feel like it, yeah. Kind of. Man. Are your kids uh, in the same route? They into music or recording or anything? Are they like, nah, it's stupid? Um, <laughs> no. Uh, my oldest son is a really good singer and can kind of play guitar, but he doesn't really care. Yeah. He's really, really into, like, long-term video gaming. Mm. like these long campaign video games hmm. like, that's his thing and that's cool that's what he's into and he, li- he likes music he likes more metal yeah. type stuff um, and then my my daughter <coughs> plays cello <coughs> she's a really good singer uh, but I don't, I don't know how much she, I mean she she likes music but not, not crazy into it but my middle my son my 13 year old son is really into it and he he writes songs and has been recording like I have a home studio built on my garage that for a minute I thought I wouldn't have another kind of studio so I built this room and then I ended up getting the building and having a whole nother space so it kind of turned into a a place to keep guitars and stuff like that but it's kind of been turned over to him mm-hmm. and I gave him just a Tascam 24 track digital recorder and he's got a couple man maybe five microphones and couple kind of cool pre you know processors for microphone preamps and i ran a little snake across the floor and i've got guitars in there i think i've got i've probably owned in the 80s number 85 86 guitars i don't know about 40 of them are there and he's he just grabs them and i'll I'll walk in there and he'll have another one out and they'll be like oh yeah this is this telecaster is really cool you know like this black tele custom that i have and he'll just play on it and he plays drums he's a really good drummer he plays in band at school plays percussion he's been playing piano since he was six he's a good piano player he's composed a couple things on on piano awesome and he play, he likes bass quite a bit too so he's he's the one that if anybody is but he doesn't ever sing he doesn't ever write any lyrics i keep telling him that his sister's a great singer and kind of a like into cool like comic books and stuff like that she's like into cool weird ideas and she 
uh, has a good lyrical ideas. I was like, she should, she should be the singer in your band, but she's 11, and he's, hmm. that's not going <laughs> to happen. But uh, in a few years down the I road, I think he'll end up being in a band. Yeah, he's just got to meet other kids that How are. How old was he? He's 13. Okay, yeah, so he's really he's getting right in there. Mm-hmm. That's awesome to be able to have the uh, opportunity to use all the equipment and all that, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. He wants to come down to the to the big studio and record. And I tell him as soon as he gives me a, a demo that it's a finished song with lyrics and everything, then we can do that. Nice. But he he won't do the, he won't do the lyrics. <laughs> Maybe one of his friends or somebody. I don't know. Maybe I have a feeling someone. he might have the lyrics, but just doesn't really want to do it. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> one of these days. Man. One of these days. Man, that's crazy. All the instruments you must have. Uh, is guitars what you have the most of? Well, aside from recording devices. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I bet it, I bet you got guitars that like your kids like, oh, I've never seen these before. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. all in cases and stuff. Yeah. And I don't have like a crazy, you know, out of this world, you know, 1956 Fender Esquire kind of thing. Like I've got some, a handful of kind of nicer guitars, but I've got a lot of what I call stinkers, yeah. which are, I think they're really cool. There are a lot of Japanese guitars. Like they're nice guitars. I, I kind of gravitate toward them. Like I, yeah. I like these '70s Yamahas and um, Tyscos, and they all have just a strange anything that has a strange sort of sound. Or, or when you play it, it just has a kind of a different quality to it. Yeah. If the, you know, I've, I've had Les Pauls. I think they're nice, but they're almost too easy, too easy to play or something. You know, like they just kind of have this sort of straightforward sound to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, you plug in some oddball Japanese copy, they have a weird sound, you know, just a strange... Same with the Japanese amps. They seem to have, like, a weird reverbs, hmm. you know, strange, strange... They'd use strange tubes, weird tubes and weird configurations and... Interesting. Yeah. Would you say like the oddball stuff is like your favorite uh, like yeah. brands basically? Yeah. Or whatever? If I if I you know sell sold everything I have, I would end up with all the weird Japanese stuff and like my Casio keyboards. Yeah, yeah. Because I really like just cheesy Casio keyboards. I had like uh, I remember when I was little, I got a hold of like uh, my grandma had it somehow like an old little old Casio keyboard trying to play that thing had like the little beat machine on there and stuff, mm-hmm. man. Is it an SK-1? I really don't know. I cannot remember. Those are pretty cool. I don't know what happened to it. I think one of my buddies, maybe one of my buddies still has it. Who knows? Get it back. Yeah. yeah they, they made a bunch of, they're actually analog synthesizers. They have these wood grain. They're, they're soon bigger, these 401, 402, 403, 45. They're, they're, they have a really cool sound to them. Yeah. Really cool drum machine kind of things built into them and weird arpeggiators that, well, you can change all these settings and it'll play chords in these strange ways i did have a like an older i don't know how old it was like a old like synth kind of organ thing i think it was a lowry yeah yeah that's, i think that's the name yeah i sold that to a buddy though but i could probably always go use it if i ever need to so <laughs> yeah it's nearby i guess but man that's Those awesome fun. now what do you think is like the future for future apple tree studio the like, future for future apple tree yeah like yeah you're gonna keep doing this till you're like 90 years old and oh or, probably yeah. i mean i don't have any ambition about it i don't feel I know, like, like you said you're not trying to be in there full time definitely you don't want to get burnt out i'm just doing what i want to do yeah, i mean yeah. um i'm like i said i'm pretty interested in, in electronics i'm i'm getting more and more interested in, in electronics and wanting to learn more about you know the sort of the more fundamental fundamentals of of circuitry and stuff like that yeah i like i like fixing things i like i like restoring tape recorders i really like um and i have a lot of tape recorders that i've accumulated because i've sort of traveled around and kind of grabbed any orphan gear that anybody didn't want to like didn't want at you know radio stations and things like that Mm -hmm. i had a couple people that i knew that worked at radio stations and kind of discovered that they sort of all have sort of closets or basements of stuff that they just don't have time to even throw away. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I, I'll take it, you know? So I kind of got into kind of 
buying it and grabbing it anytime it, it hasn't been thrown away because a lot of times people just fill up dumpsters with this stuff so i have all these tape recorders and i've figured out how to how to restore them and and i'll sell them but i, I like taking something and you know picking it up and it's a complete basket case and taking it from that to being a working machine yeah yeah that's really interesting to me and i and i and i try to be fair with people who who want them you know there's uh this guy in a band called golden fleece yeah ryan simpson i've sold him an eight track this year that was just a just a covered in dirt grime and just you would never think that it would work and i finally you know worked on it, it took me quite a while and i sold it to him relatively cheap at 250 bucks Mm -hmm. for a Tascam 38 which is the machine that's used by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard yeah. if you know that band like that's yeah. like they've done almost every record on the same machine so they have <laughs> sort of a cult following that to me restoring a tape recorder is as interesting as making a record yeah absolutely and f in fact it's almost more interesting in some ways because I don't have to deal with any scheduling or anyone you know coming or going or whatever and if I get done I don't feel like doing it anymore I can just leave yeah, there you go. And just be like, oh, I'm gonna go get lunch, or I'm gonna go home, or I'm gonna just go do something else. You're just being free, doing your own thing. Yeah, and take, taking devices that don't work, and figuring out how they work, or is really fun. There's something about that, like with all kinds of things. It's like someone who wants to restore an old car, you know? Right. Taking something broken. I used to do that too. Really? I was, I was into three, the three series BMWs. Okay. About in the late '90s but I no longer have any BMWs. Um, They're fun. They're really cool cars. Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. I was working on those quite a bit. Man, that's awesome. So the future, I don't know. I'll always have some kind of studio set up. And if you get too old, maybe the kids will take over one of these days mm, or something. Yeah, it's mm. possible that my son Peter would pot maybe be interested, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I mean... Even once they get older, they might have more of a realization, like, wow, this is really crazy. <laughs> He's got all this equipment and all this stuff. It's, like, amazing, you know, pretty much. Like, yeah, I think Peter already thinks that. Yeah. yeah but, I mean, I like to do other stuff, too. I have a sailboat. Um, I've been sailing for about 20 years. Wow. And I keep it up at Lake McBride in Solon. And we just, just had a boat that I bought last fall that I kind of fixed up this spring and took it up there and have been sailing it. Awesome. So I wanted, I would, the future for me is I want to, more nice weather yeah. in the future, I want to do more sailing and being outside. Yeah. yeah. You ever think you'd leave the QC, go somewhere south where it's always I would never nice. go south. No? Uh, if I ever went anywhere, and I've thought about this, I'd probably go to Wisconsin. Like yeah. Maybe Madison area or maybe La Crosse area. Yeah, I got a good friend of mine up in uh, Madison. Yeah, it's great. Madison's a cool town. Yeah. Or the Northeast. Um, my brother-in-law is from out there, and we go out there every other year f to go to their cabin. Oh, yeah. And so I've spent a lot of time in the Northeast, in New Hampshire. And I could live out in New Hampshire. Right. But probably won't. <laughs> I never really thought about leaving. It's, yeah. It's, it's once for a, for a minute after I, I was divorced in the late 90s, and I thought about moving, and I thought about moving to Atlanta because a friend of mine lived there. And I went there, and I liked it a lot. But it didn't last very long. The yeah. think, thinking about it, I had the young son, and I was like, "Eh, I shouldn't leave." But I've always liked the I've, I like the Quad Cities. Yeah, yeah, it is I, great. I, I, I just I don't know if I'd move any further north on this planet. I'm, I'm I don't like the winter that much. Yeah, me either. <laughs> I'm too skinny for it. I yeah, I don't have that problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the s Southwest Wisconsin and the Driftless area, I think, is really cool. Yeah, I would never go to like Minneapolis or. Right. Anywhere that far. Yeah. Out on the plains or whatever. But I think no, I need to go to the desert or something. I don't know. Yeah, that could be interesting. I've never really been attracted to the Southwest or the West Coast. Or yeah. I've been to the South quite a bit. I don't think I'd ever really want to go. I don't want to go to California. It's too expensive and overrated yeah. and all that. Yeah. But. Well, there's a lot there, but it is expensive. <laughs> yeah. 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 But uh, so uh, with recording like... Uh, I mean, obviously instruments, and you got synthesizers and stuff. Have you ever recorded like any like anything more like digital electronic type of music or instruments like that? Professionally? Yeah, or just for hobbies, I guess. Like, Not much. I have personally. I yeah. I personally like a lot of electronic music. Yeah. Um, One thing I have that I think is interesting is kind of like a. It's a weird device. It's like a blend between like 
some new and old school stuff. It's a uh, Korg Electribe. Oh yeah, I have an Electribe. Yeah, yeah. Is it one of the original ones or like? Uh, yeah, it's black. Okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know. There's so many versions of Electribes. I don't even. Yeah, know. Yeah, it might have been the f- one of the first ones. I got the one that's like, uh, it's like a big square rectangle, like yeah. blue one. Mine's black and gray. Okay, yeah. I don't know how those are set up. I know the one I have. It's interesting because it's like an electronic piece of equipment, but it still uses like the old vacuum tubes in mine. Oh, stuff. it's got a little preamp tube in it. Yeah, yeah. So I always thought that was kind of interesting <laughs> that it still had those that. Those are cool. Yeah, they have a newer one now. I don't know. I don't. I doubt it uses like the tubes or anything. I'm not sure. I think they just use that as like a an output, this to, to run the signal through on the on the way out. It's and it like, looks fancy. Like a, it looks like it some. Does. It looks like some like what someone in the 50s would think like something in the future would look like <laughs> some right. kind of vintage electronic future electronics I think they're loosely based on a Roland 808 drum machine oh yeah which is kind of a cool drum machine I've got a whole bunch of drum machines oh man nothing too crazy probably my coolest one is a Roland CR8000 which is kind of like a it's a compu rhythm I don't know if you know what that is they're the, they're the used a lot in the in the 70s and 80s for, I've heard of it but I'm not familiar for like disco stuff okay nice <laughs> yeah those are good. electronic music I, I like it a lot um, when I've done it I've done it analog and yeah. I recorded some stuff I did a project called Orchard Keepers with my friend Ben Crabb and um, this guy Jamie Cummins and we did it all sort of on tape and we had some trouble because we were trying to get some things to sync up without actually syncing them up with MIDI code or anything like that. But mm-hmm. it's cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Any other type of genre you'd like to try that you haven't yet? Like do some weird jazzy... Actually, or traditional jazz I think I could record really well. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the machines that I have, the Ampex machines and the microphones that I have and the space that I have would be great for jazz. Yeah, that's awesome. But I mean, here, I'm in Rock Island, and I don't know how many traditional jazz bands there are, and then they also have to want to record, and then they also have to want to record that way. Yeah, yeah. You never know. You know, they right. might want this like super ultra clean digital sound, and right? Not be interested. If I, you know, people have said if I'd had what I have in Chicago, I'd be busy. You know, I'd be recording twenty four seven or then whatever. You'd hate it. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I probably get people to to work there. Oh right. You know, which I, I've had here too. You know, mm-hmm. Ian, this this guy, Ian Harris, he just moved to Chicago actually. But yeah, yeah. He did a lot of work there. Mm-hmm. He did stuff for Day Trotter in my studio, and then and recording other projects there. Yeah. But it's hard to get somebody to learn the ropes that you can trust. You know, that can do everything that they need to do. Mm-hmm. Definitely, man. Your building must be huge to store all this. All your extra equipment yeah. and shit. <laughs> it's not big enough because it's. <laughs> You're gonna it's have to kinda, expand. Yeah, I would if I could, but yeah, it's the whole top floor is rented out. Mm. So the the one room is Ragged Records, opened this uh, their Rock Island store up there. There's, they actually have two rooms, and then there's two rooms that are rented by someone who has a, a, like a practice space and a recording space, and then there's another two rooms that are the same thing. So mm. it's this guy who. Uh, fixes up guitars and does guitar setups and he travels a lot um, and then kind of jams in there whenever he has time cool so I only have the first floor Ah. but the first floor is pretty crammed yeah it's crammed have to have stuff like just stacked it is stacked to the ceiling (laughs) that's awesome my wife gets she gets worried when she goes there (laughs) you're just gonna she's gonna show up you're gonna be like unconscious just under a pile of tape recorders uh, <laughs> I don't know I think she's just the exact opposite she doesn't buy anything she doesn't want any extra stuff she doesn't want two of anything you know she just doesn't right. she's not interested she's not a collector she's not into it it's a really different way of thinking yeah and I'm I'm sort of a collector but I would also I don't need anything I have that's sort of my feeling like I could have two guitars and one tape recorder and like one keyboard yeah and that would be alright It'd almost be better in some ways, <laughs> you know. All right, man, that's very interesting. That's uh, I'm glad you came on to talk about all that because that's uh, yeah, because there's no one else really around here doing it like that anymore, right? As far analog as... stuff, yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, there's a studio in Solon that is relatively new that they bought 
this entire studio from New York called the Magic Shop, and they moved it and they built a, a place called the Magic Barn. And I've never been there, um, but they have a lot of really nice equipment, Man. a lot of really nice analog equipment. I don't know what their approach or philosophy is to recording, but it's it's not that far off. Yeah. From from that, but yeah, probably the nearest place that would be like that would be in Chicago. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. But uh, yeah, well, thank you for coming on. Sure. Yeah, it was a great talk. Um, it's been an hour. Oh man, like one twenty. Really? <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know that. It flies by. Yeah, I guess yeah. it did. <laughs> now, if anyone wants to check out your stuff, you say you do have a website. If they want to go. Yeah, on. there's well, there's uh, futureappletree dot com, which is the label, and that's just like a kind of a history, and there's a little shop on there, and then my studio website is sort of floating on the piece of internet that that it, you know it's kind of like a the same server is holding my studio so it's fs2.futureappletree.com so it's f as in franks s as in sam the number two dot futureappletree.com is the studio website cool but then the main website is just futureappletree.com i don't think that there's a link to the studio on there but maybe and honestly i I, my computer crashed and I lost my editor a while ago and I haven't updated much of anything on that site for like three months. Yeah. So. Now you do get, you got the Facebook a, out and then say yeah, you on Instagram. I don't post on there very much. Yeah. All I put on Instagram is, well, my personal Instagram is, that's all I have is mostly just pictures of tape recorders. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's, they can go browse the collection. That's and about all I kind of put on there. Hell Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, yeah. thank you again. Yeah. It's a good talk. We'll see you guys later. Peace.